Papers. That's right. Oh, we're on. We're on. Oh, gosh. Life in the law on a given Wednesday. Catching up with Da Judge. Okay, with Stephen H. Levinson. Ain't that right? Okay, he's a retired associate justice of the Hawaii State Supreme Court. Right here in our studio. Fabulous. And I should also add an old and good friend. An old and good friend going way back. And with the emphasis on old. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just about 40 years at this point, by yes, my Yes, it count. is. Yes, it is. From That's the, freaky. From the early 70s, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I'd like to ask you about that. See, we, we, you know, we do have an agenda, but we don't have to get to it right away. What is your perception, your recollection of life in the practice of law in the 70s? Was it great? Was it fun? Or what, what's the wrinkle there, you know? That's a big question, Jay. I know. Jay. We have time. I mean, <laughs> remember or bear in mind that I graduated from law school in 71. You graduated in law school a little bit earlier. In 62. Yes. Two? Yeah. Oh, 65. Sorry. 65. That's when I started. And then I graduated with an LLM in 71. So that was the same year. So, uh, and I, and I, uh, came right out to Hawaii after having graduated from law school, so I was as green as possible. I, I, I did clerk for my late uncle um, on the Hawaii Supreme Court, which is Bernard Levinson. why I came to Hawaii and why I'm in Hawaii now, uh, and it was all serendipitous. Uh, it could very easily have never happened, but the point is that I was brand new. And even after the year of clerkship, which dealt with appeals uh, and, and going into litigation, which is what I uh, had wanted to do from before I went to law school, I, I had no clue as to how you drafted a complaint even. You know, f write the, the document that upon filing initiates a lawsuit. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, I had met a lot of people who did know what uh, well-drafted complaints looked like, and, uh, and so I got to take a look at some of them. Uh, but I was brand new, and so everything was uh, kind of a first-time experience, uh, and, uh, you know, you don't know exactly wh where you're going to begin. That comes along serendipitously, too. <laughs> One thing leads to another. Um, but for me, practicing law in the early 70s was, was very different from what the practice became um, by the late 80s, which is when I left private practice and went on the bench. Uh, for one thing, the size of the bar, the number of lawyers uh, in Honolulu and the state at large was much, much smaller yeah. than it became. And so if you were a litigator, you basically knew everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, and you saw most people who were in your line of work fairly often. Uh, so there was a sense of familiarity, camaraderie, uh, and hopefully friendship uh, among uh, the litigating bar uh, in, the, in the 70s. And if you wanted to make A, it would come back on you real quick. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, people who decided that they wanted to be the meanest dog in the junkyard <laughs> not only did a disservice, generally speaking, to their clients, but uh, weren't practicing at the highest level. One thing you learned was that you could fight fiercely for your client and uh, work hard to get the best results you could, but at the same time, uh, make new friends and regard the, the process uh, as collegial as, as well, one I, in which we're think, all in it together. You did do that. You were always collegial. I had cases with you 
and I had cases against you, if you remember. <laughs> I do. But you were always collegial. You were always friendly. It was really fun litigating with you. And some people, it wasn't so much fun <laughs> litigating with well, There them. were some people, <laughs> when you found out they were on the other side, your heart just sank. <laughs> we will not name names. <laughs> okay, so, you know, so... And, oh, and one other thing is you said, well, you know, we've got to learn how to write a complaint. You've got to, you know, take a whack at that. Uh, short story first, and then I'll give you my comment. You know, when I took the bar exam, which was in 68, uh, I, I, I wrote it out, you know, and I, I sent it to a lawyer, I remember who I sent it to, to look at. I sent it to Reuben Wong, okay, to look at it. And he, he looked at it. It was nice enough to look at it. And he came back and he said, you know, this is very nice, Jay, but actually they have a form. You, you wouldn't write this out. You would just fill in the bloody form. What are you doing? And these are things you don't know. You, you learn them the hard way. You make mistakes, and hopefully you don't get caught. Well, my first assigned task in my first incarnation in private practice after clerking was to draft a kind of universal wrongful death complaint so that you could literally fill in the blanks when you had particular cases or clients and needed to file a wrongful death complaint. I'd never filed a wrongful death complaint. I'd <laughs> never read a wrongful death complaint. I'd, I'd learned a lot about wrongful death, but uh, not by way of ever having seen a complaint. But having been a Supreme Court law clerk for a year, I had gotten to know very well Gunji Izumoto, who you may recall was the chief clerk of the Circuit Court of the First Circuit, city and county of Honolulu. So, and our office was just across the street from the Supreme Court building, which in those days also housed all of the circuit courtrooms uh, uh, for the city and county of Honolulu. And, and there was no history, uh, history museum there either at the time. Uh, no, that, that was Judge Lanham's courtroom <laughs> yeah. and then uh, others. <laughs> but, so I just asked Gunji if he could give me uh, a copy of five of the best wrongful death complaints that had been filed within the last few years. Things were pretty informal in those days. He said, sure, they were public record. And so I, I took the five best wrongful death complaints, according to Gunji, uh, back to the office and basically cut and pasted and created a universal wrongful death complaint where you could fill in the blanks. That was long before word processing, you know, so secretaries still had to type it all out. Uh, times have changed. <laughs> yes. But uh, that's what happened. I don't know why. And it was, it was all, and it was, it was informal. I yeah, mean, yeah. So and it was easy. Make deals. I don't think you could do that extensions anymore. Extensions and all that, you know, and people would, you know, abide by oral, oral agreements. Because what goes around comes around. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know why. But I, I have to tell you a short story about a lawyer named George, and I'm not going to say who that is. And he he filed a complaint, and uh, in the complaint it was a slip and fall case, and. He asked for uh, ten million dollars, and, and in the seventies, that was an awful lot of money to ask for in a slip and fall case. Uh, and so, and so the that was an inconceivable out, because, amount of money under any conditions. <laughs> and uh, you know, and the and the defense lawyer called him up and said, George, you know, I, I just got your complaint here, and you're asking for ten million dollars for a slip and fall case. Uh, you know, is that right? Could that be what you really want? And uh, George said, um, actually, no, I, I meant to say $10,000 for the slip and fall case. The guy said, oh, I am so relieved, you know. I, I assume you're going to file an amendment. And George said, no, no, now that I think about it, that's just a fine number. <laughs> it did well, not affect the outcome of the case, though. <laughs> nobody ever believed that number anyway. That's and true. <laughs> as far as general damages, you know, pain, suffering. So there you were. You were in, you know, your litigation practice. You were with one firm, then the other, and uh, you wound up being a partner in the Damon firm. And uh, you were, you know, well known on Bishop Street as not only a, an effective uh, litigator but also a co collegial one, which was a great thing. You know, it's hard to do that, and you did that. And somewhere along the line, you. Became well, actually, you and I collaborated. I remember on a matter that that you had uh, when I first went to the Damon firm. 
That was a lot of fun. Yes, I remember that case. That was a great case. We learned so much together. <laughs> yes, we did. And we prevailed. Yes, we did. Not as much as we wanted, but we, but we prevailed. <laughs> it felt good. It felt good, yeah. It was a collaborative. We're talking about collaboration on this program. It's all about collaboration. So, but somewhere in there, you decided to be a judge, and life changed. So how did it change when a litigator goes to the bench? You, ne you never really know what's coming, as I mentioned. But, and, I, and I loved litigating, but it got to the point where uh, I'd been doing it long enough that, metaphorically speaking, I woke up one morning and didn't particularly feel like getting out of bed. I mean, I realized that existentially speaking, I, it no longer mattered to me all that much as to most cases, whether A got the money or B got the money. Uh, and then it came to me that what I'd actually been learning to do all of these years was create records, understanding what facts had to be proved, uh, learning what law governed the dispute, uh, how the law would affect outcomes when applied to facts if you could prove them. Uh, and that meant that apparently all these years I've been learning how to be a judge. And all of a sudden it seemed like a really good idea uh, to be one. Not too many people get to be judges and so the first thing that occurred to me was, uh, am I nuts? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I had friends who uh, were former litigators um, and uh, were now on the bench. My oldest professional friend, I mean, once I actually was admitted to practice, big brother, role model, mentor, Ron Moon, was a circuit court judge by that time. Bob Klein, who I clerked with at the Hawaii Supreme Court in 1972, had been uh, a district court judge and then a circuit court judge uh, for a good while. So you knew what the so inside... I knew, it, I knew it was possible. Yeah. Uh, and so I basically put one foot in front of the other, uh, beginning with calling Ron up and asking if I could uh, come down to his uh, chambers and have a chat uh, to do a reality check. I mean, was I, was I, was I crazy? Was this just a, an unrealistic pipe dream? And he encouraged me to give it a shot um, and suggested that I uh, might want to call then Attorney General Warren Price and just run the idea past him. And I had met Warren Price in 1974, shortly after he had joined the major uh, law firm that, that he was a partner. Well, he wasn't a partner then. He was still an associate. Uh, he was famous for Mahalo, Your Honor. Now, Warren would say, after he just got beat up in court, where he just lost the case or the motion, and, and, and he had had a terrible time with the, with the sitting judge. He, he was famous for saying, Mahalo, Your Honor. <laughs> it took on a secondary meaning when you said it. Well, he did more than that. <laughs> uh, we had arrived in Hawaii with a 1971 Chevy Vega, <laughs> which at the risk of being defamatory, I will um, share my view. <laughs> Uh, that that was the worst car ever <laughs> made. And uh, shortly after we arrived uh, in Honolulu, it had been stuck on the docks uh, in Oakland during a longshore strike and finally had floated across on a Matson <laughs> container ship, um, apparently without incident. Uh, but as it was uh, sitting in the parking lot, this was still at the bottom of South Street before Matson had moved to Magic Island, under a huge palm tree, uh, a dead palm frond had fallen off the, the tree, uh, and like a, like, a, like a stealth drone 
had made a beeline right for the center of the windshield of the car and, and created a crater in it. Um, that got fixed quickly, but then the car, uh, encountering the subtropics for the first time, developed Hansen's disease. I mean, these great leprous sores were all over it. And uh, we finally decided uh, Poncho. It, being a Vega, we, we named it Poncho. Uh, was was not meant for Hawaii, and so we sold it, traded it in for a Toyota Corolla. And only after that, immediately after we no longer had possession of the Chevy Vega, my late wife decided that we should sue General Motors for a defective design of this automobile. And mental distress. <laughs> yes. I said, but we don't but have the car. <laughs> I want you to do it. So I, I uh, filed a demand letter on General Motors. Can you imagine a demand letter a on General Motors? Saber rattling letter. Right here from Hawaii Nae. From by Hawaii a practicing Nae, litigator. From this kid. Okay, and on that note, we're going to take a break because I know you want to know the end of this story. I'm going to make you wait for it. That's that Stephen H. Levinson, retired Associate Justice of the Hawaii State Supreme Court, sending demand letters in his earlier days to General Motors here on Life in the Law, catching up with the judge. <laughs> Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Okay, now usually during our breaks, you know, I, I like to get a lead on what, what the guest is going to say next, but I didn't do that. But I am very, very curious now about how the story goes with, uh, with Steve Levinson and General Motors. I think you may wish you had. <laughs> so I figured something would happen after, after the saber-rattling demand letter, and what happened was... I got a telephone call from Warren Price because General Motors had referred... You know, for a minute I thought he had bought the Vega and he was calling you. Never mind. By no means. <laughs> and, I, and I pity whoever wound up with that thing. They, they, don't, they didn't know about uh, rust proofing, you know. Okay. That's another in, case. On the mainland. <laughs> Undercoating was the limit. I, I think that was really the car's downfall. But... Uh, Warren, who was a relatively new associate with, with the firm at that time, called and said, uh, th we, we have your, your letter to General Motors, and it's been referred to us. Um, how can I help you? I paraphrase. And I told him the story. And he said, um, let me see if I understand this. You've sold the car. Yes. So... It's gone, yes. Um, so we, we won't have a chance to inspect the car. No, no, you won't. Uh, just out of curiosity, what do you expect us to do about this? I, I said, my wife made me write that letter. I, I really can't, I don't think there's much you can do about it. He said, oh, now I understand. He was good. No ticky, no. I said something like that. We agreed that we would uh, part ways amicably, that General Motors would not be um, offering a check for damages anytime soon. Uh, I felt somewhat relieved having... Um, 
not having to want, having to uh, wanting to have to file that uh, write that letter to General Motors in the first place with no arrows in the quiver, and that was the beginning of my relationship with Warren Price, and and we bumped into each other all the time over the years, and and had matters together. We were always on opposite sides, just like I always was with Ron Moon, uh, and had become friends. And so by 1988, which is when I got the judge bug, Warren Price was now uh, the Attorney General of the state of Hawaii in the John Y. Hay administration. And so I called Warren, uh, asked if I could have 45 minutes of his time, he said, about what? He said, well, let me just come up to your office, I'll explain. He said, no, no, tell me now. I told him. He said, come on up. He got the list out of all the judges and what their terms were and who was going to be retiring, and he encouraged me to give it a shot. And, and then one thing led to another, and I lucked out and uh, went on the circuit court, the trial court, of general jurisdiction um, in April 1989. And I remember, you know, you, you carried the same characteristics there. You were a great judge, but you were also collegial. And even if somebody lost, they didn't lose face. I was in the criminal division for three years, for the whole time I was on the circuit court, uh, because I'd done a, I was very interested in criminal law, criminal procedure. I'd done a fair bit of criminal defense uh, in, in my first post-clerkship uh, life. Um, and I took due process really seriously and the presumption of innocence really seriously. Uh, and so uh, I, I uh, came to understand that criminal defendants, uh, regardless of the outcome of, of, their, of their case, could accept the result as long as they believed that the proceedings had been fair and they had been treated with dignity and respect. And I can remember one defendant in particular who I ultimately had to sentence to a 10-year indeterminate uh, maximum prison term, uh, who some years later, as I was you know, parking in Kaka'ako near a frame shack. Um, you remember the moment. I do. <laughs> this, this pickup truck pulled up beside Judge Levinson, Judge Levinson. You know, who is that? in this big, uh, ominous-looking pickup truck, and it was the defendant who uh, had gone to prison. And he said, uh, he said, I want you to meet my fiance. She was in the shotgun seat, and I'm a contractor now, and here's my card, and really great to see you. Well, it's nice. It's part of you his know, life. Part of his life. When, when you get a reaction like that yeah. out of someone who you had to send to prison. Yeah. Um, the it makes you feel good. The alternative ending would have been something like, uh, Judge Levinson, do you remember that Chevy Vega? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I bought that. I've been that. meaning to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, that's a great experience. But uh, you, got, you, you spent a lot of time on the criminal bench. You became very facile on the criminal bench. Yeah? Uh, that, was, that was your mm, main assignment, was it? My one and only. Uh, the, the original understanding with then Chief Justice Herman Lum was that I would, you know, I'd be on the criminal bench for a year, year and a half to clear conflicts because uh, for the preceding 12 and a half years or so in private practice, uh, I'd done exclusively civil litigation. Um, and so this would allow enough time to pass so that I wouldn't have to recuse myself because uh, you knew so many people. Because right? I knew so many people. <laughs> uh, but somehow I just remained on, uh, on in the criminal division. Yeah. And what I discovered was, one, I was really enjoying it. It was a lot of fun. Um, the, the interaction with the juries was fun, with the parties, with the lawyers, with um, witnesses even. I mean, while they were on the stand, it was, it was a pleasurable experience and appreciating all those and I wasn't unaw I wasn't oblivious to the fact that there were two members of the Supreme Court who were getting along in years 
uh, and their terms of office were uh, going to expire, and there was a mandatory retirement age, as there still is in Hawaii, 70 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, having gotten the judge bug, it dawned on me that it would be even more fun to be on the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, and so I will confess that I set about building a portfolio. Um, you try to do the best job you can, and in the criminal division, uh, some high-profile cases came my way that got a lot of attention. Uh, and so when these retirements happened in early 1992, I mean, everyone knew uh, that there would be vacancies on the court, I decided to give it another shot and put one foot in front of the other and lucked out. It was all very karmic. Yeah, wow. And you had more than one term. I did. Uh, one is appointed for a 10-year term, uh, the nomination being by the governor and uh, confirmation by the state senate but that's for 10 years and if the judge wants to re-up for another 10 assuming that he or she is not too old to do another 10 uh the judge then petitions for retention and the is that a form uh, just like the application <laughs> is yeah uh, I, I i developed a lot of respect for marshall mcluhan during those <laughs> those periods. I mean, the packaging is really important. But uh, the Judicial Selection Commission, nine people uh, who put your name on the list in the first place that, that went to the governor, uh, own the decision as to whether you're going to be retained or not. So it's a kind of retention election mm -hmm. where, the, where the electorate or constituency is nine people. You have to get five votes. I don't know how many votes I got, but I was retained for another 10 years. That began in 2002, and I could have served until 2012, when I still would have only been 66 years old. But uh, in 2008, I woke up one morning, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. The same speaking, kind of metaphorical wake up. <laughs> and it came to me that wasn't as much fun as it had been and enough, you know and enough of a good thing is enough and beyond that is too much uh, one of the things that that a judge sacrifices or or gives up in taking the job is the right to advocate uh, for anything having anything at all to do with public policy I mean, you have to be out of politics, um, both with respect to, you know, elective candidates or elected candidates uh, and issues completely because you never know what issues are going to come before you. And you, you can't, you can't give, talk to people you, that You much. can't give the appearance of having prejudged. And you have to maintain your distance with, with litigating counsel. Too. Well, a, a lot of judges, that varies. I mean, a lot of judges, I think, go overboard in that to. respect. You were, you were friendly to the same people after you ascended the bench than you were before. My view was that uh, one of the things you didn't agree to become uh, when you went judicial was a monk. And uh, I valued my friends, uh, and so uh, my, my criterion for myself as to when I couldn't be fair was that because of the nature of the relationship, um, that would cloud my judgment. Um, and so there, were, there was a short list of people who I, I made up my mind uh, that I, that I would recuse myself mm -hmm. if, if they were ever um, involved in a dispute that came before the court. But uh, otherwise, I pretty much tried to live my life the way I had before that. We've got to take another break. That's uh, uh, Stephen H. Levinson, retired associate justice of the Hawaii State Supreme Court, who's had a really interesting career. We're learning about that now. We are delighted to have this discussion with him on life in the law, catching up with that judge. We'll be right back. 
Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversations. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here at Life in the Law, catching up with that judge, Stephen H. Levinson, retired Associate Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. As we left the story, <laughs> you were retiring. And, and, and trying to get back to a, a freer intellectual life, and that is a freer life, you know, where you could express positions, take positions, be part of the... Other than through written opinions. Other than through written opinions. <laughs> That's right. I mean, so, you know, this metaphorical morning, I woke up and, de woke up and decided that enough was enough. And so uh, my wife Kathy and I had discussed it uh, at, by that time as to when a good time would be to retire, and we decided the end of the calendar year 2008. So that's when I retired. Uh, and, you know, you try to uh, establish a, a tentative game plan for retirement. I, I know you certainly did. Uh, and it's worked out very nicely. Yes, it um, has. But I, so I, I set some rules for myself. The first one was I wanted to take a few months off and basically have no obligations at all and just decompress and relax and have fun. And um, I did that for, I think, a slightly shorter period than I thought I was going to need to. Uh, but, it w but it was a good thing. Uh, but then uh, I, I set some more rules. Uh, the, the second rule was, uh, thanks to the State of Hawaii Employee Retirement System, uh, I didn't really have to worry too much about money. I mean, say what you will uh, for good or ill about the state of Hawaii. The employee retirement system is very good to judges who have a fair number of years you under had, their you belt. You had a fair number and, of years. And I, you, with, you were one of with, the longest running judges in town, yeah, ever. I, well, for various reasons, at least as of then, that, that's true. I mean. Justice Paul Nakayama is going to eclipse, eclipse me by a lot, um, but that that is true. Um, and so, so with all the credits that I had, including unused sick leave, including the clerkship year um, when I was a state employee that I bought back, that's the best investment I ever made. Um, my retirement was going to be. Um, very generous. And so I didn't really have to worry all that much about money. Uh, and so rule number two was no work for remuneration. Just do what you enjoy doing, what you want to do, what you feel passionate about doing, um, but don't take money for it. Uh, and a related rule three was no attorney-client relationships. Didn't want to have to have a client trust account, didn't want to have to have errors and omissions insurance. Um, and uh, rule number four was kind of the umbrella rule, uh, and that was uh, you don't have to do what you don't want to do, do what you really want to do. Uh, and so I, I thought about all of those things and uh, was approached by the ACLU of Hawaii or, or, or various representatives of it uh, very shortly after I retired. Uh, they were interested in, in me joining the board, and I was quite flattered and eager to do it. So 
I went on the board of uh, ACLU of Hawaii, which I've now been on since 2009. Shortly after that, a uh, group of board members from Equality Hawaii, which was at Marriage the Equality Hawaii. Well, Equality Hawaii is the name of the organization. It uh, was the largest LGBT advocacy organization in the state. Uh, at, and its primary mission at that time was first uh, to lobby for a civil union law, which is a kind of second class marriage, but a lot closer to um, the legal status than same sex couples had ever uh, gotten before uh, in Hawaii and, and uh, um, at least as of the mid 1990s anywhere else in the world. And you had written an opinion uh, that would make you expert in that subject. Well, I, I wrote the lead opinion uh, in Bear v. Lewin, which was filed in 1993, and which actually was the first opinion, to my knowledge, in the history of the world, first judicial appellate opinion that held that a state's marriage laws restricting access to marriage to opposite sex couples was presumptively unconstitutional. And when I wrote that opinion, uh, the issue was purely uh, an, an abstraction with me. I, I didn't feel any personal connection to it. A year, a, a year and a half after the opinion was filed, my daughter came out, which uh, is a, a story in itself. But um, uh, made it much more personal. Uh, but the court not having uh, the issue before it uh, was, was uh, um, not in a position to, to address that issue. Uh, and I just kept my own counsel. But uh, now that I was off the bench and my First Amendment rights were fully restored, I could be an advocate. And so I was very happy to go on the board of Equality Hawaii and, and um, was part of the group that, that pushed initially for a, a civil union bill. The legislature passed its first one in uh, 2010, and then Governor Lingle vetoed that bill. And so the next year, the uh, legislature passed one again, first candidate Abercrombie and then Governor Abercrombie made it clear that uh, he, he, he supported the bill and, and would uh, sign it as soon as it reached his desk, which he did. Uh, and having made it clear that the group was not going to be satisfied with civil union as a sort of second class form of marriage, um, the push began um, and, and uh, had begun uh, on a nationwide level for full marriage equality, and that happened uh, in a special session of the legislature in 2013, after the United States Supreme Court had handed down a couple of very important decisions, and the federal courts generally around the country had begun uh, striking down same-sex marriage bans uh, in various states around the country. Uh, our legislature, after a lot of lobbying, a lot of hard work, uh, and a lot of intrigue, uh, passed the bill and uh, the governor signed it uh, very quickly in, in November 2013. So special session. As a, in, uh, after the special session. And then uh, effective December 2, same-sex couples could lawfully marry in Hawaii. So I married two couples on <laughs> December 2 and, uh, and, and just, and just uh, did same-sex marriage number 32 a couple of weeks ago. So that, that, that's, uh, I, I felt that um, I, I was finally getting some payback for all that work. Not it, really. <laughs> It, it wasn't until I was halfway through the first marriage ceremony on December 2, 2013, when it finally dawned on me that we'd won. 
you know, we didn't have to fight anymore. Really happening. And, and it was really happening, um, and now thousands of same-sex couples have uh, married in Hawaii, yeah. which is and a it, and very the, happy thing. The movement is going worldwide, but it's not over yet. Can you give us the status of the law, at least in the United States? Well, uh, overwhelmingly, the federal courts uh, in the United States uh, since 2013 uh, have been ruling in favor of marriage equality. Uh, the notable exception, there's a second, but the notable exception was the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, which has jurisdiction over federal litigation in Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee. I, I know that because I was born and raised in Cincinnati and, <laughs> okay. and grew up in the Sixth Circuit. And the Sixth Circuit went the other way. And so uh, the um, uh, losing same-sex uh, couples in those cases uh, appealed or applied for further review in the United States Supreme Court. The court agreed to review um, those cases further, and they're set for oral argument uh, on April 28th, which is just next month, month away. about a month away. Um, and the, the, the general expectation among people who uh, are knowledgeable uh, is that uh, probably by June, certainly by August at the latest, because that's the end of, of this year's uh, Supreme Court term, the court will rule. And uh, most people who are... Um, familiar with the subject believe, and I believe, that it's virtually inevitable that a majority of the court is going to come out uh, in support uh, of, same, of, uh, of marriage equality, same-sex marriage, on federal constitutional grounds. Could be 5-4, could possibly be 6-3, but uh, unless the composition of the court changes, between now and when it's argued, and that's very unlikely unless someone gets ill, knock wood, that they don't, um, the ball game should be over by August of this year and marriage equality will be the law of the land. If you look at the globe, you know, the map of the world, uh, it is really quite astounding uh, how much of the world is now same-sex marriage country, marriage equality country. Virtually all of Western Europe is. Geographically, most of South America is. Uh, most of the North American continent is, 37 of, of uh, the United States and, and uh, all of Canada, uh, and part of Mexico, fairly soon probably all of Mexico, um, Oceania, I mean, New Zealand, South Africa, um, became a marriage equality country 10 years after apartheid was struck down. Really quite it must remarkable. must give you a certain level of gratification to see this all really arguably in the wake of Baird v. Lund. Which uh, only goes to show that uh, even a very, very small place like Hawaii, uh, yes. out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, literally the remotest population center on the face of the earth can change the history of the world. Yes. And I think we did it. Yes, you did it. Well, we only have a minute left, Steve, and I, and I wanted to ask you one last question, uh, and it had nothing to do with the Vega. Yeah. <laughs> Good, because we don't have time. <laughs> we beat that one. No. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> there are people out there, you know, who are faced with the same kind of uh, wake up in the morning question about should I serve on the bench? Uh, and, you know, we always want to have the best judges we can have on the bench. And I wonder if you could talk to them for a minute and tell them your thoughts about how they should decide the question and what considerations they, could, they should give. I don't know if I can do that in less than a minute, but the bottom line is that I have learned to trust my gut, which has expanded and contracted over the years. <laughs> it's in a You're period of expansion <laughs> right now, but you trust it. Um, the times I have made decisions and my gut said, don't do it, my gut was right. Um, it, it, it's still a, a, a roll of the dice to make it onto the bench, and, and one is a very lucky kid. 
uh, if one has an opportunity to do that. But if that's what you want to do, go for it and go for it as strategically and effectively as you can. Okay, you heard it from Stephen H. Levinson, retired Associate Justice of the Hawaii State Supreme Court here on Life in the Law. We are honored to have him here with us catching up with that judge. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>